Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There was once a king in uh, Persia who had heard that there was a tree in India. And if you could find this tree, there would be given to you eternal life. So the king brought his most trusted minister and told him about the tree and told him about the fact that he thought it could be found in India. And he sent him on his way to find this tree. And the minister was very pleased that he was given such an important assignment. And he packed what he needed to go to pack, and he went on his way. And when he got to India, finally, he would ask people about this tree. And people would always give him directions. They would say something like, in the jungle, three days to the left, there's this one tree everybody talks about. That's the biggest tree in the jungle and has the most uh, branches and, and, and is the tallest and the widest. And he would go there and he would find nothing. And he would ask again about this tree. And people would always give him a, uh, a direction towards the tree, but they would also uh, make fun of him and tell him that many people have been looking for this tree and nobody's ever found it. Well, he kept at it and he would always stay in communication with, uh, with his king and his king would send him funds to continue his search. And this went on for years and years and years. And finally, the minister began to get incredibly frustrated and uh, sad about the fact that he couldn't find this tree and he became hopeless. And on his way back, he ran into a holy man. And with tears in his eyes, he told the holy man the story about how he had been sent to India to find this tree that would give you eternal life. And he hadn't been able to find it. Was there any advice this man could give him? And the holy man looked at him and laughed. And he said, this tree you're looking for is the tree of wisdom. But it has so many different names. Some people call it the ocean of wisdom. Some people call it the sun of wisdom. Some people call it the ketub. So many people have different names for it. But you have been stuck with the name. So you've been looking for a tree. And what you should have been looking for is wisdom. And then wisdom would bring you towards the true attributes of reality that bring you to eternal life. And those attributes would bring you towards the essence of what will bring you towards eternal life. So you have been confused. Your king has been confused by words. Words will not take you to where it is your king wants to go. Form will not take you to where your king wants you to go. You need to go beyond form and enter into the attributes of truth into the attributes of God. And with entrance in the attributes, you enter into essence. And when you can find essence, you can find reality. But what's happened to you, and it happens to so many people, is that in looking for reality, you look for reality in form. And what you find is that form is a veil. And every time you look for the truth within form, 
you reach another layer of veils. And you can keep pulling away these layers of veils. But as long as you're seeking form, you'll never get to the truth. You'll never get to reality. You'll never get to the attributes. And you'll never get to the essence. Each of us needs to understand that if we are to find the truth ourselves, we somehow have to get to the essence of things. And language, form, visions, everything that we see and hear with this, within this illusory world is a shadow, a veil, a separation between ourselves and the truth. We have to go and find that which is beyond the veils, beyond the separations. A man of wisdom sees one. An ignorant man sees many. A man of wisdom understands the unity in existence. An ignorant man tries to emphasize all of the separations in existence that he can think of so that he can make himself separate, distinct, and in his own mind more important. A man of wisdom tries to do away with separations. An ignorant man decorates his separations. He emphasizes his separations. He makes his separations important and makes duality important. He wants to be separate from everybody else because he sees things in this world as separate. The ignorant man cannot love beyond that which he identifies with himself. He can't love that which he doesn't yet understand, nor does he want to begin to understand that which is beyond him, different than him, separate from him in his own mind. Imagine the world of I, and then imagine the world of not I. What isn't like me? When am I not I? Imagine a circle, and in the middle of the circle, a dot, as if you drew it with a compass. Uh, you place the compass in the middle, and then you draw a circle around it. Imagine if you're sitting in the middle of the circle and I and not I, yes and no, are rotating around the circle. From your perspective in the middle of the circle, if you've given up the self, you have no attachment to yes and you have no attachment to no. So you see all of these arguments. You see people constantly arguing with each other, coming to no conclusions. And yet, you're in the middle of all this, neutral, in a state of reality. Can you get to that place where you don't need to be involved in the conflicts of others? Where you don't need to have an opinion as to the conflicts of others? Where you are inert to the conflicts of others? where you're not magnetized and pulled to the conflicts of others, where you are separate from conflicts, where, you, where yes and no are not in your vocabulary, where words are no longer what's important to you, where form is no longer what's important to you, but where Essence is what's important to you. If any of you have ever been 
to a desert, and I mean a large desert, you'll see that there's not a lot there to give you sustenance. There's not a lot there to maintain life. When the Israelites were taken by God from Egypt, they were taken into a desert. And for those of you who know your Bible stories, you know that they traveled through this desert for 40 years. Now, they could have trekked across this desert in a few months and made it to Canaan, but they didn't. They sort of were taken in circles for 40 years. And one of the reasons for that is God wanted them to truly understand their dependence on God. In the desert, when the Israelites wandered for 40 years, they were supplied water and they were supplied food by miracles from God, which made them understand their total dependence on God. We go to a grocery store. And in the grocery store, there are shelves with produce and shelves with various kinds of canned goods and all other kinds of foods. We don't see the farm. We don't see the farmer. We don't see the farmer's dependence on grace to be allowed to raise his vegetables. If there's too much rain, the crop doesn't come in right. If there's not enough rain, the crop doesn't come in right. And on whom does the farmer rely in order for the rain to be at the right amount and the sun to be at the right amount and the temperature to be at the right amount? so that he can raise his produce. He relies on God. There is no other intervening source. God supplies all that which allows the farmer to be able to raise his vegetables. But when we go into the grocery store, we lose contact with the dependence upon the creator for everything that comes towards us and comes to us. We have been separated by veils which hide the truth from us. We have been separated by form which hides the truth from us. When they were in the desert and they had no food, and then all of a sudden, manna came from heaven, and there was food there available for them. They were quite cognizant of the fact that all was dependent on Allah's grace and Allah's mercy and Allah's generosity. There were no intervening factors. There were no veils. This was direct evidence that was seen by everyone. And it is related that even with this, and even with understanding this, they complained. They said, how can we be expected to eat just one food every day? Before we came into the desert, we had onions and we had greens and we had all different sorts of vegetables. Now we're limited to this one. Is this fair? So even when the direct evidence of the generosity of God is shown to people. There's still room for them to begin to complain and begin to want more and to be lacking in gratitude. We, each of us, 
have to examine our own lives. And as we do this examination, we have to be able to be grateful for what we were given. Grateful as opposed to desirous. Grateful as opposed to needing more. Grateful as opposed to wanting to change everything to coincide more with our desire as opposed to reality. Desire is what causes us to be driven from truth. Desire is what causes us to lack contentment. Desire is what causes us to create veils between ourselves and our creator as opposed to pulling veils away from the separation from ourselves and our creator. Desire causes us to be malcontents. Desire causes us to complain. Desire causes us to set up situations that we cannot find our way out of and causes us to wander for years and years and years, but not wander in a state of proof of our Lord, wander in a state of dissatisfaction with what we've been able to accomplish within our lives. Wander not knowing where we're going and why we're going there. Wandering because this desire, for whatever reason, seems not to be able to be fulfilled. Desire continues to grow and grow and grow within us. A dervish who was rather well known in the kingdom was wandering around and ended up near the palace. One of the king's guards saw him and ran to the king and told him that so-and-so the dervish is right near the palace and I know you have great regard for him. Should we call him in? And the king said immediately. And they called him and told him that the king wanted to see him. And he had a good relationship with the king. And he came into the palace and met with the king and they exchanged pleasantries. And the king said to him, I will give you whatever it is that you want that is within my capabilities. And the dervish had a backpack or a pack behind him. And he pulled out a little cup and he said, fill this cup with gold coins. And the king smiled and said, it'll be my great pleasure to do that for you. And he ordered one of his men to go get a bag of gold from the treasury. And they began to put gold coins into the cup. And as many coins as they put into the cup, it didn't fill the cup. So he sent for another bag of gold. And the same thing, they put the coins in the cup and it didn't fill the cup. Did it with a third bag. Finally, he said to the dervish, this must be some sort of magic cup because I've certainly put enough gold coins in to fill it. And the dervish said, this is the cup of desire. The cup of desire can never be filled. And all of us need to understand that the cup of desire can never be filled. Our desires cannot ever be satisfied. The nature of desire is such that it can't be satisfied. So what we have to do individually is figure out how to remove desire from our being. Desire is the beginning, the starting point of all of our attachment to illusion. Desire is the beginning point of everything that forms as hallucinations within the mind. Desire is what drives us to constantly chase after 
the form in this illusory world. Now, everyone's desires have a bit of difference to them so that we feel we are chasing different things. But in truth, everybody is chasing the fulfillment to their desire. The only difference is the form that that desire takes. So we should understand that we're all working from an essence that's similar. Now, this as an essence isn't a holy essence. This essence is actually <clears throat> a satanic essence that takes us in the wrong direction. But those essences exist. And we see that essence as a car or as a house or as a woman or as wealth or as fame. But in truth, the essence of it is desire. And we become addicted to desire. And unless we can turn around from that desire, then we are going to be left with a lifetime of chasing things that we can't get. It's like the cat chasing its own tail that just keeps going in a circle, or the dog that chases cars. Now we are men and we're acting like animals. We're chasing that which is unattainable. There was a, a man who didn't like his shadow. And wherever he went, his shadow followed him. And he didn't like the sound of his footsteps. So he decided that he was going to run away from them. He was going to run away from his shadow, and he was going to run away from his footsteps. Well, the faster he went, he couldn't lose them. The shadow always kept up with him, and he always heard his footsteps. So he decided that the answer to his dilemma was to just run faster and faster and faster. And so he did that. He ran faster and faster and faster until finally he fell over dead. What he didn't realize was that he could escape from his shadow by just going into the shade. And he could escape from his footsteps by sitting down and not moving. There was a way out for him, but he didn't have any wisdom. And therefore, he couldn't find the way out. There's a way out for us. And we're not necessarily looking to get away from our shadow, but we are looking to get away from the qualities that we have that don't take us to reality. The qualities that we have that bring us, as opposed to the truth, that bring us to confusion and bring us to a constant state of agitation and stress and difficulty and dissatisfaction. We have to learn how to remove ourselves from those qualities. In order to find the qualities that belong to truth, we have to remove from ourselves the qualities that don't belong to truth. You can't be in a constant state of anger and agitation and also find love. You can't be in a constant state of jealousy and resentment and also be in a state of compassion. We have to understand that these qualities aren't conducive to being together. As a matter of fact, they're opposites from each other that push each other away. So we have to make a determination in our life what it is exactly that we're looking for? What is it exactly that we are trying to obtain? 
that we want to be our life. Allah, in his mercy, has sent mirrors into this world. Mirrors that don't show you yourself, but show you who you truly are, not who you believe you are. Mirrors that show you what a man is supposed to be, what a man can become, and how a man can become that. These mirrors are God's lights that he sends into this world. And because these men have no need to be recognized, have no need to proclaim themselves as important, they are without self-motive. And when they've lost that self-motive, Allah's light can enter into them, and their light can then shine out to those who encounter them. And then through God's light, we, each of us, can be altered because of our interaction with that light. And this is something that we can strive to become. This is something that we should strive to become. We need to release ourselves from self-awareness. We need to release ourselves from that which we hold on to, which is the separation of the self. We need to be able to be unified with the rest of existence because Allah is unified with the rest of existence. There is a uh, Sufi tariqat in northern Turkey called the Halveti order of Sufis. And one of the rituals that they would do is they would sit two of the men or two of the dervishes in front of each other and look into each other's eyes until the self disappeared and they merged with the one they were looking at and couldn't tell the difference. We, each of us, needs to understand the unity in existence and the fact that God is in all of existence and is not separate from us. We need to understand that and simultaneously understand what is it that separates us from God. And what separates us from God is all of the separations we have from all of the things within this world. So our separations from other men separate us from God in a reality. If God is within our brothers and sisters, and we move away from our brothers and sisters, if we resent our brothers and sisters, if we are angry at our brothers and sisters, if we create distance between ourselves and our brothers and sisters, we are separating ourselves from the God within our brothers and sisters. So it's as if some of God is okay for us, but not all of God is okay for us. And you can't take some of God. You have to take all of God. And in order to be able to take all of God, you have to stop the distinctions that separate everyone else from you. You have to learn 
to do away from these distinctions and you have to learn to do away with the separations. And if we can't do this, then we are creating a situation where we will live a life in illusion, in constant illusion, in constant obeisance to form alone. And then we believe that our interaction with form is the extent of our life. Now, there are countries who basically preach this. They will tell you that economic sameness among men creates heaven. And this is the ultimate that man can obtain. All of their focus is on form. All of their focus is obtaining what's in the world. And all of their focus is on maintaining that which they obtain in this world. Now, if any of us takes a moment to look at the world, we see that people are constantly disappearing. So this attachment to form disappears. This holding on to form disappears. It can't be done. Yet this philosophy is telling you that that's all there is to be done. And this lie, for some reason, is accepted because we are so powerfully sensual, we are so powerfully mind-driven, we are so powerfully visual that we tend to believe that which, that which we cannot see, that which is outside of the comprehension of our eyes or our minds or our senses doesn't exist. And in truth, that which we can't see is more powerful than that which we can see. As a matter of fact, that which we can't see, I'm sorry, that which we can see was created by that which we can't see. So there is an entire universe of light which we can't decipher. And within this light, there is the world of God. And within this world of God, there is consciousness. And within this consciousness, within light, there is eternity. And this eternity is available to us, but it's not available to the ones who believe in form and give all of their obeisance to form. There has to come from within us a change in the way we understand the world, in the way we understand existence, in the way we see our path through existence. Our path is one where we come from a world of light into a world of form and back to a world of light. And even though we can't see or understand this light consciousness, Allah, God, has sent to us prophets, saints, light beings, holy ones, who've explained all of this to us and explained how it works. Well, we have to believe something. And the question is, what is it that we're going to believe? Some will tell you, if you can't see it and you can't understand it, you shouldn't believe it. Others will tell you that it is within faith that your strength lies. Your ability to be able to believe what you can't see and what's been taught to you by the messengers of our creator 
what's been sent to us by the Holy One is where our truth lies. And we have to take a stand somewhere. We're either going to take a stand with the world or we're going to take a stand with God. But if we take a stand with God, it has to be within the truth of God, not within all of the falseness that religions carry and that religions promote and about the separations that they promote. We have to understand the unity within existence, the unity within all mankind, and the unity that we share with each other. And that within that unity is truth, and within that truth is our connection to our Lord, and within that connection to our Lord is the pathway towards eternity in the light world of Allah. So it is Allah's intention that we move in that direction. It is Allah's intention that we find that light world. He created us to find that light world. He created us to become with him, in him, merged with him. He created us to follow that path. So we have to decide if we're going to take that path or if we're going to live a world within form and make form what's important to us. So we have a choice. The choice is form or light. The choice is form or qualities. The choice is things or reality. You see, all of form is things, things that have a temporary existence within this creation. And if we align ourselves with that which is temporary, we will be temporary. But if we align ourselves with that which is permanent, then we can be eternal. This is our choice. This is our free will. This is the decision that we have to make in this lifetime. And we have to pray to God that he gives us the strength to have the faith to believe in his qualities, to believe in his mercy, to believe in his compassion, to believe in what we cannot see. And we have to ask him to show us the true way and reveal that truth to us so that we are <clears throat> sure in ourselves that our certitude is strong and that our faith is strong in our creator and that we can come to know him and that he will bring us close to him. This is our prayer. This is our objective. This is our goal. This is our birthright, and we have to take advantage of that birthright. It is meant for you to be eternal. It is meant for us to know the truth. It is meant for us to commune with God. May it be so for each of us. Amin, amin. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa